Hey, Journey, welcome to After the Message Conversation of Pastor John and Pastor Dustin. Yes, sir. Good to see y'all. So uh, thanks for joining us here on these weekly uh, conversations. What we try to do, just kind of follow up uh, what we're talking about uh, in our message series um, and some other things that are happening in our church family as well. Uh, for example, we're coming back on site again uh, on September the 13th. We're excited about that. We've got a special prayer and worship uh, gathering this Sunday evening. We'll talk about that more in just a moment on August the 30th and get into that. Um, so, um, but that's kind of the conversations that we have, just, just so you can hear from Pastor Dustin and I and, and to dig in just a little deeper on, on some of the topics that we're addressing on the weekends. Pastor Dustin preached this past week. If you didn't get a chance to hear it or uh, watch it, I encourage you to do that great message on uh, the Spirit leading why talk about race? That's the, uh, the series title we're, we're talking about uh, for the few weeks here. And this past week was because the Spirit is leading. And Pastor Dustin, you began your message by uh, talking about a trip that you took to the African, the West African country of Ghana. And uh, one of those sobering, jarring images of, uh, of a slave castle of where people from Africa were literally uh, kidnapped, taken there, and then sold, and then brought uh, to America and other places into slavery. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about, a little bit more about that experience. Yeah, it was, it was it's hard to put into words what it was, yeah. uh, other than tragic, and to know that this is something that we can do to each other. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I went in and shared some, some things, but I could have shared a lot more. One of them sure. being is, uh, there's a door that I, that I showed, and I didn't go into the meaning of the door. Uh, that door is the point of no return. Mm. You go in that door, the other side is a ship waiting to take you into slavery somewhere around the world. Right. And and just the horrific stories of hearing that and that being feet from a church, that being anywhere, but then knowing that there was a church inside. And I was grateful for the opportunity to be reminded, um, but I was heartbroken. We, and, and, and until you kind of process that a little bit, and in some of my reading, I don't have the exact st uh, statistics in front of me, but the number of marriages, I mean, there were husbands and wives, they never saw each other again. The number of children that were separated from their parents, they never saw each other again. Once they got beyond the point of no return, once they got beyond that door, uh, their life as they knew it, and consequently, the impact that has in succeeding generations. Uh, the breakup of the family. Yeah, and so I was talking to one friend of mine, and he said, Dustin, he said, part of the heart, this is African-American friend, he said, part of our struggle is we're, we don't know where we're from. Exactly. He said, Dustin, you're Danish. Yeah. He said, you know that. You, you can trace that back. Yeah. And he said, but what happened and what I, I, I've learned and got to see and, and experience in some ways is these are slaves from all over Africa, yeah. which is a continent, not a country. Yeah. And they're all over and then shipped out. And so uh, there's so many people that don't know the history of their own people or their own lineage. or uh, And so it's just heartbreaking to, to have that reinforced and understand that that's so many of our brothers and sisters and friends and neighbors and coworkers. That's a different experience than what I'm able to trace back. Yeah, exactly. You, you mentioned uh, one of the things that you saw while you were yeah. literally standing on top of that castle or on top of the wall were some children uh, playing on the beach. Yeah, one of the um, the highlights of that trip, not not a lot in that one day, is I'm standing on top of the, the castle and I'm taking it all in, processing what I'm seeing. And it's right on the water. And so you have, uh, this is modern day now, this is last year, and I'm, I'm up there and I see all these boats on the shore, just kind of parked, fishing boats made out of wood. Uh, probably 30, 40 feet long fishing boat, all right there. And what was so beautiful were the, there was all these kids, probably 10 to 15 years old, playing soccer right there on the beach. And as I'm taking this in from a slave castle and I'm watching that, the thought came in my head, they don't have a care in the world right now. They're just playing soccer, just like every other teenager around the world, which is exactly how it should be. And for, for me to see a redemption side of that on the same property, mm -hmm. Africans, G Ghana kids right there playing soccer 
carefree, enjoying it exactly how a teenager should live. And I thought, thank you, thank you, Lord. Hate that what happened. Thank you for that, though. Thank you for the redemption of what you are still doing and trying to do uh, there and all around the world to rescue people. I had a similar experience of um, <clears throat> going to a place that it, it's probably uh, needful to see if you have an opportunity, but it's, uh, it's, it's very painful to see. And that is, uh, I went to Auschwitz, the uh, uh, German uh, concentration camp in Poland. Uh, Auschwitz uh, is where they say about a million people, close to a million people, were actually killed uh, in the, the German concentration camp. And I went there back in 2003, I believe it was. And it was just one of those situations where you just can't, it's, it's hard to take in. So it, it's hard to believe what people did to each other uh, in the name of whatever religion or ideology they were doing it in, but they did it. And they did it well, and they did it systemically, and they did it uh, administratively. It was it's it's just hard to it's hard to take all that in. But one of the things, just real quick, when 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 you go to Auschwitz, they have a little canteen cafeteria place, and the tour guide told us you need to eat now before you go in, because when you come out, you you won't be able to eat, you you won't have the stomach, and uh, just again a reminder of of history and, and what, what people do um, to, to one another. And, and we're thankful that we're able to look back, learn some things, and to see how is God growing us. And, and that's part of why we talk about this topic is how is God growing us. One of the things you've talked about since I've known you is the idea of revival. You, you, you said you pray for revival every day. I know in an office that you have here at, at Journey, you have a, a something on the wall that says pray for revival. What do you mean by that? And where did that burden come from? Uh, can I jump into what you were saying and then answer that question? Sure, absolutely. You were talking about something. And um, going to the places that you and I just mentioned were not easy. No. It's not easy. No. Having the conversations that we need to have today aren't easy. Right. Going to the places mentally are not easy, but I'm grateful that we got to see so that we now understand a little bit more. And I would say this when it comes to uh, painful history, whether it's in our family or whatever the case may be, I think what we're trying to do is if I had gotten a car accident right now and I went to the emergency room, the very first thing the doctor would do is take a bright light and shine it on where I'm hurt. Mm -hmm. Not to shame me, Mm -hmm. but to figure out where I'm broken so he could bring healing. Sure. That's what some of this conversation is. We're not trying to shame anybody, anything. It's, It's we need to understand where we're at so we can bring healing, so we can invite God in to heal and so that we can move forward. I had a, a statement that hit me this past week. You know, I'm not... I'm not saying it's anybody's fault, you know, that, that it is someone's fault or, an, or, or a race's fault. I'm just saying we need to recognize it is. Yeah. It is. It was and it is. And what are we going to do about it? Particularly as followers of Jesus, what are we going to do about what we know and, and, or what we now know and what God's teaching us? Absolutely. That's good. So, so revival. The, so the question on revival. So, um, so I think for me... As a Christian and as a pastor and as a dad and a husband, I think for me, uh, first and foremost, I want to wake up every day and I just want more of God. Mm. And the crying out for more of God is where that, for me, that revival spirit is. And it's not just, God, I want God to bring revival to me. I, I need a work done in me every single day. Mm. But then as a leader, I, I, I'm praying for that for, for you. I'm praying that for for journey, for this community, for Central Florida, that that God would give us more of His presence, that God would give us more of His favor, His anointing. If, if I've learned anything, it's that one one ounce of God's favor is greater than any anything else I can get in yeah. life. And uh, and God says in, in Matthew seven, if you seek it, you will find it. If you knock on the door, it will be answered. And yeah. so what I'm committed to doing is I just want to knock on that door every day until God gives me what I want, which is more of Him. Yeah, we. Um, one of our favorite authors is a guy named Mark Batterson. Yeah. We both like uh, Mark Batterson books. And he said the answer to any prayer, any prayer you want to pray, the answer to any prayer is more of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's the answer to any prayer, more of the Holy Spirit. That's what I need. I need more of the Holy Spirit. So 
when you say, God, give us revival, that's what you're saying. Lord, yes. give us more of your spirit. I want to be filled with your spirit. I want to walk more in step with where the spirit's leading, right? And God is uh, always available, uh, but it's an invitation only type of process. He's not going to force his way mm -hmm. into anything. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that he knows every day, God, you have me. Mm -hmm. Every day I want to remind him, hey, whatever it is today, whatever it is you want to do, come and do something in and through me. Yeah. And I don't want a day to go by that I'm not asking that, not just for myself, but for Journey, for our staff, for our volunteers, for the community. Yeah. Uh, that's my prayer. And when it comes to the idea of revival, one, it is spirit-filled <laughs> and spirit-led. So absolutely, it's led by the Spirit, for the Spirit to honor the Father. But it's very inclusive. That's what revival is. Yes, revival is right. a, it's an inclusive. It is an all skate, as I talked about. Yeah. It is not an exclusive event, day, opportunity. It is, it's inclusive. Yeah. And uh, just on a side note, when it comes to revival, I don't, I have this process that I say in my head. <laughs> I don't know how to create a move of God, right. but I do know how to turn one off. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm aware of in my life is I don't always know how moves of God come about. I'm just going to keep knocking, 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 and by His grace, hopefully we get there. But I am control of missing something, and that's, that's, it's, it's in Scripture. It's mm. my pride can, can distance right. me from God. James 4 talks about pride. And so there are certain things that I can do to turn off the Holy Spirit. We can quench the Spirit. We can mm -hmm. grieve the Spirit. All those things yeah. talk about what we can do to, to stop the yeah. flow of God. 100%. Yeah. And I don't think we're always aware that we can and do do that. Yeah. Now, um, you mentioned all skate, uh, a, an important theological question. Were you a good roller skater? Did, <laughs> did, did, did you do good on roller skates? Well, uh, no, I actually have a scar. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not, I have a scar right here. This is more ice skating. Oh. Okay. But this will give you an indication of where I was at. Uh, Imagine middle school, Dustin, if everybody goes clockwise, yeah. I was going counterclockwise. No. And so what I was doing in ice skating, I was, I, was, I, I was going counterclockwise yeah. during a lock-in, and I was also doing my, my best Pete Rose forward slide, mm -hmm. and, and another student just ran over my finger. Oh, no. So I was not a good with, roller with skater. With ice? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. wow. Yeah, and that's got to... So I was not good roller skating. Um, I was more of the... Uh, two hands on the rail yeah. type of skater. Yeah. Some of y'all are good. You can go backwards and do all that. Nah, nah. Dancing. You know, yeah, you're like dancing. dancing on a roller boogie. No, I can't. You want a roller that. boogie? No. But I yeah. liked it, gotcha. but I, can't, I couldn't do it. All right, a little side note. Sorry, <laughs> I just, you know, had to ask. Were you a good roller skater? I was all right. You know, I, I, I always got blisters on my feet. I remember yeah, that. That's true. Uh, that was the bad part. Uh, you, you spent a lot of time. Well, hey, before we uh, move away from the idea of revival, so Sunday night, uh, this Sunday night, August 30th, at the Apopka campus in the worship center, we're in the building. We're doing a time of really praying and preparing and worshiping uh, about coming back on site and what we can do. And I thought you had a really good insight about what, what that night is specifically for as we pray. It's not just a yeah. typical worship night. We really want to be in prayer about some things. Yeah, for me, the heart of the night is, is, is anybody can come for any reason, obviously. Right. Uh, but for me, the, the real impression is, is um, I think sometimes we can come to God uh, because we want something from Him. And, and I'm not even saying that's necessarily bad. Right. I, I love to experience more of God myself. Uh, but really what I would like to do with August 30th is have a time of prayer where we're actually leaning into God and asking and, and crying out for that revival. As, as we resume back up, God, would you bring revival to me, my family, the community, praying over the pastors, the volunteers, and just is, is more about praying and seeking for others in the community than just coming and getting. And, uh, and I believe that, that when we come together trying to bless, I believe God ends up doing something supernatural in us anyways. It's just a matter of perspective shift. You spent a lot of time in Acts chapter 2 in this message. One of the favorite chapters, I uh, think, of all uh, church leaders. Yeah. We hear a lot. I've heard a lot over my ministry in Acts 2 Church. What's an Acts 2 Church? And you took us inside an Acts 2 Church. By the way, huge shout out to Pastor Dustin. He he pronounced a lot of difficult names. I mean, you were all over the map, literally. And we want to show you that map again real quick that we uh, put up for the message. I thought, by the way, that was such a cool graphic mm. to see all those different regions and uh, cultures and nations that are referenced in Acts 2 to kind of see where they come from. 
into the city of, of, of Jerusalem and how God began uh, to speak in all those different languages uh, right out of the right out of the, the chute, so to yeah. speak, uh, as as the Spirit gave utterance for them to do that. Yeah, and that's three continents over fifteen. Yeah. And, and I didn't get into this, um, but it's a minimum of fifteen different cultures. Yeah, some scholars have it up to fifty or even more right. that were present. And uh, and so even even just someone in my own family said I didn't realize how far Rome was, and knowing the trek there. And then and as you see it, it converges in the map. It converges. But it wasn't to bring the church together and hang out. Right. It was to bring the church together so that they can go into all the world. And that's what Jesus said in Acts 1. He said, uh, you'll receive power and the Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, which is where that Acts 2 is, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So as you look at that map, you can kind of see all those arrows kind of converging on Jerusalem, but the goal was never just to be a Jerusalem-only church. It was to then go back out, and it took the church a little while to figure out, hey, we're not just supposed to hang out in Jerusalem. We've got to go out. In fact, it took a persecution to kind of knock them loose, and that's the message this weekend. Yeah. Now we're going to kind of pick up on, so how did it go from just being a Jerusalem-centered church to going out into other cities like the city of Antioch, which is a huge, a prominent role in this weekend's message. The message I'm going to be doing this weekend is called Why I Talk About Race Because the Gospel Demands It. And we're going to see how the gospel begins to go out from what yeah. you taught on in Jerusalem. And that should be the model of the church today. Absolutely. And so it's not just, hey, everybody come to Journey and let's just hang out at Journey and be around Christians. It's no, no, no. Come to Journey. September 13th, yeah, right. <laughs> come to journey, okay? Experience God, experience the Holy Spirit, and then go back to your workplace, go to your neighborhood, yeah. take the gospel with you. This is, the church should be more of a, a huddle where we stack hands and then we say break and then we go do ministry. Yeah. It's never the end result coming to church. It's, it's to get the instructions to go out and live the gospel uh, throughout the week. Amen. Amen. That, uh, that, that was really good. You, you, you really uh, had, uh, I thought there's two key questions in that passage in Acts chapter 2 that you made really the cornerstone that you kept coming back to, which I thought was really good. And the questions are, what does this mean and what shall we do? Talk just a little bit more about how that is so important yeah. as we approach Scripture, just hearing from the Lord, what does it mean and what should we do? I think, though, first of all, when you ask any question, it's an automatic sign of humility, mm -hmm. and so which is where God does His best work. Mm -hmm. And so when you begin to ask questions about anything, whether it's Word of God or whether it's about a, a post or a political this or, or that, when you begin to ask questions, it makes your posture humble, and that's where you have a position to learn and to grow. And actually what people don't realize, that's also where you get influence. Mm. And so many times we want a knee-jerk reaction to something, but it's in questioning that we grow the most. I, I think questions, I hear so many people say, oh, I know I should know this, but I go, no, no, no. Questions are a sign of growth. I love questions. Yeah. And they asked two great questions, and these were people that weren't bought in yet. And they asked these two questions, and I think these questions, uh, as I mentioned in the message, should be questions we're consistently asking. What does this mean? And God, what should I do? Yeah. And when we ask that, what we're doing is we're giving the Holy Spirit permission to work. Because when we ask a question, now we're trying to listen for an answer. Mm -hmm. And so many times I'll hear people, I don't know where God's leading, or I don't know this. When was the last time you asked Him a question and listened for an answer? Mm -hmm. And so if you just breathe in and say, okay, God, what does this mean and what should I do? And then just listen for an answer. I'm convinced the majority of the time he'll answer. And I think there's a cultural application to that, particularly where we are right now in this moment. We believe we're in some really rare, uh, unusual moments in our history uh, from the, the coronavirus, from uh, the racial reckoning that we see ta taking place, uh, from what's happening you know, politically. That's such a good question to ask. What does this mean? What does this mean, God? And what should we do about it? And that's where the people of God need to need to step up. What 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 should we be doing about these things? I even shared this. I was talking with somebody in my family um, 
one of my kids, and we were watching a, a recent protest, and there was clearly pain, and and, and I don't know if I, I would agree with every every way this person was expressing themselves. Sure. And the knee-jerk reaction is to just respond, say something. But my kids and I, we were processing that and go, okay, what is it you think they're going through? Mm. There, there is some pain in there. What, where is that pain originating and why? Mm -hmm. And when we ask the questions, we, we could get, begin to process or at least try to process and go, okay, now that might help us a little bit more understand. Doesn't mean we agree, disagree, but at least let's try to understand. Yeah. Well, one, of the, one of the statements that you made in the message was that uh, the opposite of prejudice is hospitality. The opposite of prejudice is hospitality. Explain that, that, that thought. Yeah, well, if, if prejudice is, in a sense, it's, it's two arms saying, no, 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 you got to stay back. You're kind. Uh, I'm not a big Boston Celtics fan. You, you, go, you go over there. Uh, Milwaukee Bucks are trying to take out my magic. No, 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 you're over there. Um, if that's prejudice kind of hands out, I think hospitality is saying, no, 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 come on. Come on. Hey, hey, why don't you pull up a chair? Matter of fact, no, uh, don't pull a chair. Let me come to you. Hospitality is is the invitation to to a life. And that's what 1 Thessalonians 2.8 says. It says, we loved you so much that we didn't just give you the gospel. We gave you our lives as well. And so we didn't just love you on Sunday. We actually loved you on a Friday night around a dinner table. You, you, you referenced, uh, to me anyhow, uh, uh, specifically one of our senior members, showing hospitality to someone who was very different than, than yeah, her. Yeah, this was, this was really cool. Uh, it was probably two years ago. Okay. Um, I was in the atrium. So you were fairly new here. Then. I was fairly new. I was in the atrium, and I saw somebody uh, in the atrium that was clearly standing out. And I don't mean just because of what they look like. You could just tell they weren't sure of what was happening. Yeah. And I went and introduced myself and come to find out this person had never been to church. Never in his life. Wow. Maybe 23 years old and just got out of prison. And somebody handed him a Bible and said, you should check out Journey. Hmm. And, um, and this person uh, completely um, broken and overwhelmed. I mean, imagine coming from prison, never going to church, what you're already thinking you're going to be viewed as. Yeah. And is an African-American and he's got tattoos. He's got dreads. And he and I are talking, and then I have to go to the restroom. And then when I come out, and this is before service, when I come out, he's gone. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm so frustrated. I really wanted to connect with him, and, and the service is starting. So I go in the service, and then uh, midway through the service, I kind of turn around, and I, I see him sitting with somebody. And I thought, that's weird. I was like, I wonder, he told me he didn't know anybody here. How did that happen? So I went after, after the service, I went and talked to them. And it was uh, an 80-year-old white lady that he had connected with. Wow. And then he had to leave, and I asked, I asked this person, I said, I said, how'd y'all get connected? And she said, well, I just saw him standing by himself, and, and so we started talking, and I realized he didn't have anywhere to sit, and so I invited him to sit with me, and I thought, oh, Journey, I said, you get it. That's, that's hospitality is when you see somebody that doesn't look like you, she didn't know his story. She right. didn't know anything about him. Yeah. She just saw somebody is by himself, and that shouldn't be the case. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter your history. It doesn't matter your past. It doesn't matter your color skin. Nothing else matters because at the cross, everyone is welcome. At Journey, everyone is welcome. And when I saw that, I said, that's why I'm proud to be at Journey. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely love that. And I see that consistently yeah. take place. And that's one of the marks of journey. And we got a long ways to go. Right. But that's one of the themes that I absolutely love. I thought that was so good. One of the things, and we'll kind of wrap up maybe with uh, this, uh, this is a quote that I read. Um, that, uh, it says, the spirit does not remove our diversity. Because one of the things that you, uh, that you talked about in your message this week, uh, that there is one body and one spirit and one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who's over all and through all. That's uh, what Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. Um, the Spirit does not remove our diversity. Rather, He enables us to love, hear, seek, understand, and pursue one another in our diversity. With the Holy Spirit, we hear and understand. Without Him, 
we misunderstand through fear, distrust, and self-ambition. Unity cannot be engineered. It is a matter of the Spirit. And I know there was one part in your message where you were saying it's the Holy Spirit that makes alcoholics sober. It's the Holy Spirit that takes bullies and makes them joy-filled and encouraged. It's the Holy Spirit that takes greedy people and makes them joy -filled. It's the Holy Spirit that takes racist people and makes them cheerleaders of all races. The Holy Spirit takes indifferent people and makes them free or makes them agents of reconciliation. The Holy Spirit takes wounded people and brings yeah. healing. Mm. And that, that that's what the Spirit is leading yeah. and has been from the beginning. One of the one of the great uh, references you made is in Acts 2, uh, 39, which to a lot of folks who've been around Journey for a few years, that'll sound familiar to you because Acts 2, 39 is the promise scripture. The promise is for you. Uh, yeah. The promise is for you and your children, for those who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Mm. So that's what Acts 2, 39 is. Uh, it talks about right after, you know, repent, be baptized, yeah. the promise. What is the promise? Well, that promise that the Spirit is is leading and tearing down those walls. It's for us. It's for our children. It's for those that are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And what we believe in is not that we're, we're trying to be progressive or, or that this movement is more progressive than that movement. No, no. What we're doing is based on a promise. Yeah. This is the promise of God. And it's not about being progressive. It's about fulfilling the promises. Yeah, and when we get in on what God's doing, that's that's a whole idea. Yeah. Is where is God moving? What is his promises? We already know based on what he's already said. And so now we just got to get ourselves in line. And when we don't, we actually, you're talking about this idea of unity. We're missing out by not having all the different kinds of people around one table. It's, it's like looking at a baseball field and not having a center fielder. We're missing something mm. if we don't have them all. Yeah. And, and it's exactly that. This is not, Acts 2 was not a, man, I'm so proud of these people. They pulled up their sleeves and figured this out because they were progressing. No, 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 no. It wasn't a man-made right. progress. This was a spirit-filled initiation. And um, one of the things I think about is um, this idea of, of following the Holy Spirit and walking with God. I kind of process it like walking with God. And that's what we're doing when we're following the Holy Spirit. We're inviting ourselves to walk on this journey with God. And I'll, I'll guarantee you this. Every time we walk with God, we will always go somewhere that is uncomfortable. Yeah. Always. Yeah. We saw it in the scriptures. He was going to houses of sinners. And, and, uh, and some of the people are very uncomfortable. So as Christians, we need to understand that is the calling, mm -hmm. is to embrace some uncomfortable situations, uncomfortable conversations. We're going to be at a restaurant and God's going to speak to you and say, hey, go share the gospel with that person. And it's going to be, that's really uncomfortable, but that might be what the Spirit leads you to do. But that's, and that's how you ended the message with how the Spirit, even yeah. though you may didn't, maybe didn't have the language for it as a high yeah. school student, but that's that's what the Spirit prompted your friend to do. That's exactly And right. you went with him. Yeah. And so one of the things I, I, I did share in the message is how my buddy felt a, a tug from God to go to the table, but one of the things I didn't connect in the message is we didn't have the language at that time right. to understand that that was the Holy Spirit. That is the Holy Spirit. How old were you then? We were probably 16 or 17. Okay. And that, that is... You definitely didn't have the language. That, no, we didn't have the language. Probably not a lot of spiritual we, language. We, we, we thought it was Taco Bell, not God. You know, we weren't sure what, what, what it was. And that's what the Holy Spirit is. And sometimes we have a hard time kind of uh, identifying, well, is this what the Holy Spirit's moving? And if it aligns with Scripture and it's uncomfortable, it's probably the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And I would encourage you, find a way to say yes this week yeah. to at least one thing the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. And, I, and, I, and we can end with this. Is I remember hearing um, one of the things I process a little bit is I heard this phrase is, it's impossible to say the phrase, no, Lord. <laughs> because the exactly. moment you say no... He's no longer Lord. Yeah. And so we've got to get into a better rhythm of never telling the Spirit, no, it's yes, 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 because we are under the Lordship of God. Yeah. And that's what we're called to do. Amen. Pastor Dustin, uh, so good to share with you again. Thanks for unpacking a little bit more yeah. of that uh, uh, message. Great message. Again, if you haven't seen it or listened to it, I encourage you to do that. Why I talk about race? Because the Spirit mm -hmm. is leading, and he certainly is leading uh, in some uh, really uh, significant ways here at Journey. 
And we're going to be talking about this weekend. Why talk about race? Because the gospel demands it. And we'll pick up on a couple of those concepts that Pastor Dustin uh, introduced us to this past week and uh, kind of develop that out a little bit more. Journey, join us Sunday night, August 30th for our night of prayer and worship. We look forward to having you. Five o'clock at the Apopka campus. It's indoor, so we don't have to worry about rainstorms uh, coming on us. So we can pray and prepare for coming on site that we'll see revival, that we'll see uh, a work of God in our heart, in our church, and it'll just spill out from us. Yeah. Hey, thanks for joining us on uh, After the Message Conversation. We're loving the journey. Have a great week.